these are very generic questions i think you should be right very briefly We are done with that. We can pass on to the next. Yeah. You can write, uh, write uh, list any two genotyping techniques uh, which uh, which is which you think. Uh, could be used for genomic assisted building. Uh, we understand that you may not be uh, having the facilities, but like theoretically what you have been dealt with <coughs> among this, uh, among the techniques which you believe which could help in genomic assisted building. Any two techniques uh, which you think would be useful. Okay, we are done. Can we move ahead? Yeah. So the third question is, how will you determine the nature of nature or number of genes governing a trait or the genetic nature of uh, the trait itself? If you have to give a number like if it is monogenic or so what 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 will you do to ascertain how many genes govern a particular trait any of the trait which you are dealing with you can say one two three The fourth question is, what are the segregation ratios of a dominant and a co-dominant marker in a bill population? I suppose you know what BIL is. So for dominant marker, what is the expectation? And for a co-dominant marker, what is the expectation in a backcross inbred population? The fifth question is in a back BC1 F1 population, back cross 1 F1 population, what is the expected range of recurrent parent genome recovery? You just need to write the numbers, number or numbers, whatever it is. And the next one is, uh, what is GEBB? What do you mean by that? And if you want to elaborate it, you can do that as well. Like. Just a statement on what it means.
the seventh question is what are the components of a breeder's equation? Uh, in the inaugural talk, the chief guest mentioned about different aspects, right? So, uh, as he said, the basics still hold good today, even today in the genomics era. So, this equation famously given in the year 1937 forms the basis for whatever we do, whatever tools we do, the basis remains the same, okay. If you can write the equation, fine, otherwise write the what are all, what are all the components, yeah. Eighth question is, uh, you have to list any three varieties developed through Marcaster breeding along with the genes and the traits which have been introduced in any of the crop varieties. And uh, if it is an example from India, it would be preferably be good. But if you have any other examples also, you are free to add. Yeah. In any of the crops, be it field crops, vegetable crops, So write the name of the variety, <coughs> the genes and the trait, that's all. No need to elaborate on it, like just. The ninth question is, what do you mean by BV's effect? And we will move on to the tenth one. Uh, list any two differences between shuttle breeding and speed breeding. can mention the advantage of one or disadvantage side, any, any aspect, any two differences. And this is a generic one, like uh, you look at application of a genomic assisted crop breeding, uh, genomic assisted breeding in your crop of interest, like what, what technique you would like to do or what, do, what, is the, what is the knowledge on which you, what knowledge, based on the knowledge you have, what techniques you think you will be useful in your uh, breeding approach for improving the crop of your interest. And the, maybe one breeding approach and one genetic tool or genetic tool, yeah. And, and the last one is any specific topic or topics of your interest uh, which uh, you think, although we have made the training schedule already, we have made it. Like if you think you are interested in any specific topic, then we will, we will look at it and then 
think about including sometime in the evening cover it so that it can be useful any specific topic okay It's a quick fire one, but we are already running late. Good, good, good afternoon once again. Uh, I'm, now we are going to start our lectures, formal lectures on this training program. And the first lecture will be delivered by Dr. E.K. Singh. And uh, Dr. E.K. Singh, uh, I think uh, you are by now familiar. Dr. E.K. Singh, he is presently uh, Joint Director of Research as well as Head of Genetics at IRI. He is basically a rice breeder and uh, Dr. E.K. Singh did his, BSC, uh, his PhD, uh, MSc and PhD from IRI New Delhi. And uh, ever since uh, he selected, got selected in ARS, he has been working <coughs> at IRI New Delhi in this division itself. And uh, he has having a rich experience of working as a rice breeder. And a large number of wheat varieties, uh, sorry, rice varieties have been developed by Dr. E.K. Singh. And uh, not only this, Dr. E.K. Singh was the pioneer as far as uh, molecular breeding in this division is concerned. He was the first one, uh, he uh, started mapping of fertility test storage in, in the rice, and then he started systematic molecular breeding program. So I think one of the best and the pioneer uh, rice uh, molecular breeding program is there. That is all because of Dr. E.K. Singh. And he has been working uh, continuously for last maybe more than 25 years as rice breeder. And he is an example, it means his work is an example how you can use uh, genomic tools in crop improvement. In most varieties, almost all varieties, he has used molecular breeding uh, tools and techniques. So this is a uh, uh, real example that how you can integrate these genomic tools and uh, uh, techniques in your breeding program. And I think uh, he's the most appropriate person uh, to start this uh, uh, series, uh, uh, this uh, lecture, and uh, because of his rich experience in molecular breeding. <coughs> so now I request uh, Dr. E.K. Singh uh, to deliver this lecture on the a decade of molecular breeding rice. So I think uh, he's a pioneer in molecular breeding rice and uh, he will uh, share his experience and also uh, you will benefit from uh, his uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So welcome once again, friends. Thanks, Dr. Vinod, for your generous words. Uh, Mike.
Ja. So. Do, do we have some audience available elsewhere? Can you check the sound if it is okay? Welcome once again, friend, and I'm going to talk about sign. Okay. Well, does this work? No. Huh? No, the forward. Only laser, no? No, but this is not work. Forward is not working. Okay, I will use it from here. ये ये लाइट जरूरी है बिकॉज इसके वजह से फिर यहाँ पे दिखेगा नहीं दैट लाइट इज टू ब्राइट सी इफ यू कैन मैनेज विदाउट दैट नो Reset. Okay, so uh, I welcome you back to the technical session, and this is the first uh, lecture of this uh, training program. And what I'm going to do uh, is to tell you about what are the potential applications, and uh, what is all that we have done through molecular breeding. I will be taking up some examples and uh, try to build a story. I will not go into too much of the uh, scientific component probably there will be individual lectures where you will uh, discuss the mm, uh, scientific component of many of the issues related to marker assisted breeding. I will also come back in form of some other lectures where I will talk about some of the specific issues like uh, mapping population or uh, bulk segregant analysis and things of that kind. But for today uh, presentation I am going to talk about the uh, use of molecular breeding in improvement of basmati rice how we have implemented it and what are the success story. So if you like, look at the uh, traditional varieties of basmati rice, they are very tall, they are prone to lodging. As you can see this picture, everything is flat and uh, they have long duration and they're very poor yielding, about 2.5 tons per hectare, not more than that. Now this has been a major bottleneck uh, of the traditional varieties of basmati rice. And that's where in late 60s, Dr. Swaminathan, when he was uh, at this institute heading the division, conceptualized the idea of combining the quality of traditional basmati into high link background. And this breeding program started, and uh, in 1989, we came out with the first dwarf high link variety, that is Pusa Basmati 1. In 2003, we developed Pusa Basmati 1121. And, uh, then the first uh, mass derived variety was released in 2007 in the name Improved Pusa Basmati 1, which has two genes XA13 and XA21 for resistance to bacterial leaf blight. And in 2013, we came out with another dwarf high yielding variety, <coughs> which is very early in duration, about 120 days seed to seed maturity, that is uh, Pusa Basmati 1509. So these two varieties, 1121 and 1509, are very popular now. 1121 is being cultivated in 1.2 million hectare area and 1509 is roughly cultivated in uh, 0.5 million hectare area. If you look at the journey of Basmati breeding program starting from 1933 and uh, 1930 as a matter of fact when the first uh, variety was released Basmati 370 and look at the grain length on cooking in this case uh, is uh, just about uh, 13 millimeter. But uh, subsequently, the varieties which came like Pusa Basmati 1 in 89, 2003, and 2013, 1509, they have got substantial improvement in grain length. 
Now, how this became possible, because at that point of time when this development was happening, not much was known in terms of understanding the quality of uh, the genetics of quality traits. What are the genomic regions that are contributing to Basmati quality traits? Some basic inheritance studies were done, but we did not know anything about the location of genes. And all this improvement happened only through phenotypic selection, that you make a cross between two varieties, identify plants in F2 generation, and you do phenotyping by cooking. Virtually phenotyping is done by cooking and looking at the grain length on cooking, how much elongation is there. And uh, then you identify two lines, both are elongating, then you go for an intercrossing of these lines, and through selective intermating selection, selective intermating selection, we were able to improve this grain length, and this has happened indirectly by pyramiding the cuticles or genomic regions which were influencing the grain length on cooking. They were dispersed into different parent, but they were brought together. But the manner in which they were brought together was primarily based on phenotypic selection. Now that we know precisely how many genes or cuticles are involved in governing each of the quality traits, and therefore you can do it in much more predicted manner through molecular marker assisted selection. So overall, if you see what has happened that the duration of uh, varieties has reduced. In traditional varieties, we had 160 days duration, which has now come to 120 days in 1509. And the yield has improved from 2 tons per hectare to almost, you can see, 6 tons per hectare. Generally, you don't find this seizure-like curve in plant breeding. You know that if you increase the duration, yield will increase. But decrease duration and increase yield is a sort of uh, negative association. But we were able to break this and we were able to produce the genotypes with shorter duration and having higher yield and therefore the farmer's profitability was increased. And this has been widely recognized by the press, media, nationally and there was a recent article covered uh, on new basmati to boost export. So uh, currently if you look at the total basmati export value from India is about, uh, in terms of uh, value terms, it is about 32,800 crores per annum. That's roughly about 5 billion US dollar. And 95% of this export earning comes from the variety developed at IRI, primarily 1121, 1509, and now we have come out with number of other varieties. But then what are the major challenges that we need to address through molecular breeding and what we have done on that aspect is something which is the core of this particular presentation. So in rice, we have number of biotic stresses, which include bacterial leaf blight, blast, brown plant hopper, seed blight, bacane, false smut, and uh, many, many more things. Now, the question is that to control these diseases, farmers are using pesticide. And many times there is a concern in many importing nations, and that is very right, that the pesticide residue is coming in the imported uh, grains. And if there is a pesticide residue, you have issue with the acceptance of your consignment. And therefore, the most viable option is to incorporate genetic resistance in these varieties so that you don't need to spray pesticide and you can produce grain free of pesticide residue. So that's where we started, you know, working on this through molecular marker assisted back cross breeding. And this is the typical scheme where you all know that in a back cross breeding program, we have a recurrent parent, which is a very good variety, a widely adopted, high yielding, but it <coughs> lacks in one or two specific characters. And to rectify the specific weakness of an otherwise good variety, we go for back cross breeding. And in back cross breeding, we use a donor parent and a recipient parent, and then we do repeated back crossing with the recurrent parent to recover the genome of recurrent parent with one or two or three traits from donor parent as the case may be. Now this uh, marker assisted back cross breeding is a new approach where we try to expedite the back cross breeding program. You know that conventionally it takes about six to seven back crosses are required to recover the recurrent parent genome to the extent of 99% plus. But if you want to reduce that, if you want to expedite that process so that if you can recover 95%, 96% in two back crosses, you save a lot of time. 
And if you gain time in your breeding program, your <coughs> efficiency increases, your genetic gain increases, because in genetic gain, one of the component is time that is taken to achieve certain level is also important factors. So the back cross breeding has got, uh, you know, these four important components, which is assisted by molecular marker. The first one is uh, foreground selection. And when we talk about foreground selection, it refers to selection for the gene of interest, which we are transferring from the donor parent. So that is called foreground selection. Then we have recombinant selection. Whenever we bring a gene from a donor parent, that gene will also bring some flanking genomic regions, okay? And those flanking genomic regions might have some disadvantageous trait. And those traits, if they come in a recurrent parent, they will spoil the quality or other good characters of recurrent parent. And therefore, the effort is to minimize the flanking genomic regions and have only the gene of interest or minimal flanking genomic region. And that is done by recombinant selection, where you identify a set of markers which are flanking the gene, but they are polymorphic between the donor and recurrent parent. And in BC1, BC2 generations, you select plants which have at nearest flanking marker, they have the alleles of recurrent parents. Now, if you are able to do that from both sides, then your, the flanking genomic region can be minimized. And if this flanking genomic region is associated with undesirable character, generally we term it as linkage drag, okay? So, but if there is no drag associated, there is no adverse phenotype, probably we need to create a balance whether we spend so much of time in recombinant selection or not, if it is not adverse. If there is some positive trait associated, it is better to retain that rather than eliminating it, okay? Then the third aspect is background selection, where we try to recover the recurrent parent genome. And for doing that, we select a set of markers that are polymorphic between donor and recurrent parent, which are dispersed throughout the genome at a uniform distance. And for example, in case of rice, we take about five to six polymorphic markers, which are located throughout the genomes, covering the entire genome length. So if you take six markers per chromosome, so roughly you get about 72 markers on 12 chromosomes. And these markers are polymorphic at uniform distance. And at these marker loci in backcross generations, then you identify the plants which are homozygous for recurrent parent allele, okay? So in BC1F1, for example, this question was asked in your, uh, you know, pre-evaluation examination, okay? So now you can tell me what answer you have given. What is the range of recurrent parent genome in backcross one, BC1, F1 generation, what is the recurrent parent genome recovery range? <laughs> 50 to 75. One answer. 50 to 100. Another answer. This side. 75. 75 to 100. This side. 75. 75 only. So, now, for example, if you have 200 plants in BC1F1 generation, first you do foreground selection. And if it is a single gene that you are transferring from donor, then 50% of those plants, that means 100 plants will be negative for the gene. So you are left with 100 plants. Among these 100 plants, you have to identify a plant which has maximum recovery of recurrent parent genome. And on that plant, you make a backcross to produce BC2F1 seeds. Now, what is the range of recurrent parent genome recovery in BC1F1 among the 100 plants? The right answer is that it will range from 50 to 100 percent, minus the trait of interest, rest of genomes. Theoretical possibility is that you can get plant which is as bad as the F1 plant with 50 percent genome, and you can get a plant which is as good as recurrent parent, 50 to 100 percent. 75% is the average recurrent parent genome recovery of 100 plants. That is the average, okay? So it is not that all 100 plants will have 75%. Now your job here is that through molecular marker assisted selection, you should be able to identify a plant which has more than 75% recovery. Then only you are gaining by using markers. If you end up selecting a plant with 75% recovery, which is average value, then you are not making much gain. Or if you are selecting a plant which is less than 75%, you are not making a gain. 
So it has been possible to identify plants having up to 87, 88 percent recurrent parent genome recovery right in BC1, F1. But what needs to be done is that you have to have a large population, okay? Because these markers will help in identifying a plant if it is there. And how the plant will be there? It will come through process of recombination. If you are dealing with large number of genes in the background, then the population size has to be large. If you just grow 100 plants and hope that you will get a plant with 100 percent recovery of recurrent parent genome, that is not going to happen. This is one of the major limitation in back cross breeding program that our BC1 F1 or BC2 F1 population size is usually not very large. We deal with about 100, 200, 300 plants only and that is where we are not able to make that fast progress. So we can do that and once you identify a plant with higher recovery of recurrent parent genome, use that plant for making crosses to generate BC2 F1 plants. Just on a single plant you can produce 200, 300, 400 seeds and in BC2 F1 itself you will end up with 95 percent recovery. Then you self such plants in BC2 <coughs> F1, go to BC2 F2, identify the plants which are homozygous for the target locus and you are done with your product for multi-location evaluation. While doing this, we should also not miss the phenotypic selection, okay, for the target trait and also for other traits. At least intermittent phenotypic selection should be done. And as a breeder, whenever you are doing such program, you must make it sure that if you grow your BC1F1 population, along with that, you have one row of recurrent parent. After every, say, three rows of BC1F1, you grow one row of recurrent parent. So that by comparing the plants in neighboring row, you should be able to identify the plant in BC1F1 population which is closest to the recurrent parent. Okay, otherwise it will be difficult for you to find out which one is close to recurrent parent, which one is not. The genotype will tell, but phenotype can also tell if you have recurrent parent side by side grown. Okay, so for phenotypic selection there are several parameters that you need to go and evaluate. So this is what we started doing and we had the program to transfer the bacterial blight resistance from a donor IRBB55 which has XA13, XA21 gene and it was transferred in Pusa Basmati 1 through marker assisted back cross breeding program. Your course coordinator Dr. Gopalakrishnan was pretty much involved in this program as his PhD research topic and uh, we came out with a variety which is called improved Pusa Basmati 1 which has XA13, XA21 2 genes for assistance to bacterial leaf blight. Now if you look at these uh, two plants where chromosome 8 is represented by a graphical genotyping and you find that this is uh, XA13 gene on chromosome 8 here. If you have to select out of these two plants, which one you will select where the black color represents the donor, uh, the recipient parent segment and this represents the donor segment, okay? So which one you will select out of these two? It's very obvious that the donor segment present in this plant is much larger and in this one it has the gene of interest plus it has a small segment of donor and such plants should be selected. So that's where this molecular analysis would help you in identifying the plants with maximum recovery of recurrent parent genome. Subsequently, we incorporated gene XA13, XA21 in Pusa Basmati 1121 and here we used improved Pusa Basmati 1 which also we call as 1460 as donor. In first case, we used a non-Basmati donor and transferring gene from non-Basmati to Basmati was difficult because quality used to get, you know, distorted. But once we had these bacterial blight gene in a Basmati background, uh, subsequently we have used this as a donor to transfer the gene into uh, other Basmati varieties. So in 1121 and several new lines were developed and one of this line has been released as Pusa Basmati 1718, which is resistant to bacterial leaf blight and this line also carries gene XA13, XA21. So this was part of a PhD program of uh, your another course uh, associate uh, Ranjit who worked for his PhD with me. Now this variety is picking up extremely well with farmer, it has a very strong culm, non-lodging habit, yield is much higher than 1121 with excellent grain and cooking quality. Another variety we have is Pusa Basmati 1728, which is improvement of the recurrent parents are different. 
So the first one recurrent parent was Pusabhasmati 1, second one was 1121 and this one is Pusabhasmati 6 in which we have transferred XA13, XA21 and this variety 1728 has also been released for commercial cultivation. You know, the social media plays a lot of, uh, you know, uh, important role in uh, promoting these varieties. If you go to YouTube and just type uh, Pusa Basmati 1718, you will find hundreds of videos. And these clips are about six to seven minutes produced by different uh, farmers, progressive farmers, entrepreneurs, and they have placed it on the net. And uh, each one of these has got a view of 50,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakh, uh, you know, times have been viewed. So uh, that's how the technology has uh, a very fast spread and the social media has played a very important role in taking technology to farmers. We have initiated also mapping new genes for resistance to bacterially blight and in this we had a donor identified called BAM72 and uh, this BAM72 has got resistance to bacterially blight. Genetic analysis showed that it's a recessive gene segregated in 1 is to 3 ratio and then uh, QTL-seq approach was used and those methods will be described to you in detail how QTL-seq is used for identifying genes like we are doing bulk segregant analysis. We can uh, constitute two pools of contrasting phenotypes and these pools are sequenced. And through QTL-seq analysis we identified the genes that is responsible and a few candidate genes have been identified which are being further validated. Neck blast is a major problem in basmati rice and this is caused by Magnoporthy grisia and this fungus is very notorious and to control neck blast farmers have to use uh, fungicides very extensively. Tricyclazole is one such fungicide which they use and uh, tricyclazole has been banned in European Union. So if you have tricyclazole in a quantity of 0 0.01 ppm that is 1 milligram of rice is 1 milligram of tricyclazole in 100 kilogram of rice, the consignments will be returned back. So EU is so stringent and EU is a very potential market for our basmati about 6,000 crores annually we are exporting in the EU market. So that is where it becomes very important that we must have resistance and we initiated a program to incorporate major blast resistant genes in the background of basmati varieties. So here you can see the genes like PI1, PI54, PETA, PI5, PI9, PI2 and PIB, the seven genes for blast resistance through marker assisted back cross breeding, simultaneous but stepwise transfer approach, they were mobilized into Pusa Basmati 1. And now we have in Pusa Basmati 1 background, one gene, two gene, three gene, four gene, five gene, up to seven gene pyramids. And one of this line has been released. So you can see here as a donor, this particular line which carries the genes PI9, it has got red pericarp, it has got chalky grains, and the grains swell on cooking, and the quality is not good. So when you use such bad donors, it is much more challenging task to recover the recurrent parent genome, which we have been able to do through molecular marker sister selection, and the new lines have got excellent grain and cooking quality and resistance to blast disease. As you can see here, Pusa Basmati original is completely killed here. It doesn't have the gene. In same Pusa Basmati one, when we have transferred PI9 gene in uniform blast nursery at Milan, all plants are green, nothing happens to this. So this way, uh, we incorporated this gene and then uh, a variety called Pusa Basmati 1637 has been released for commercial cultivation. And this is a field view on farmer's field where the farmers have a lot of liking. The variety has high yield, about 28 quintals per acre yield and complete protection from blast disease. So Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, Secretary uh, Dayer and DG ICR visiting the fields. Uh, on farmer's field of uh, 1637 to see how the performance is. Now, uh, we discussed about background selection, how we do, how many markers we employ for background selection. So generally, we use about six to seven markers per chromosome, about uh, 72 markers in case of rice, which are polymorphic microsatellite markers. And in this, uh, what we have done, we have compared the efficacy of different marker system. One side we have SSR marker, another side we have SNP markers. There is a 50K chip available, which is developed by Dr. N.K. Singh in RCPV. So we genotyped the set of near isogenic lines with both 72 markers SSR and the same lines were genotyped with uh, also SNP chip. 
of 50K. So 50K has got 50,000 markers. So that provides much more dense coverage as compared to 72 markers. And when we looked at the recovery of recurrent parent genome, we found that if we use limited number of markers, there is overestimation of recovery. But if you increase the number of markers, you get a realistic estimates. But then the cost is another factor. Uh, how far we should be able to, uh, you know, accommodate because in plant breeding activity, you also have to look into the cost, how much you are investing, how much you are getting. I think uh, with time to come, we will find that most of the genotyping systems will become very cheap and then we can increase the number of markers for background uh, selection. Another disease which is very uh, common in basmati rice is Bacana disease. This is caused by a fungus Zibrella fujikori and this fungus produces zebralic acid in the plants and because of that the plants grow tall and finally they dry. So you can see here in this field some plants are little white, they are dried and they are tall. And uh, to control this problem we initiated a, a mapping project where we selected, we screened a large set of germplasm. One of the lines in our breeding program PUSA 1342 was found resistant to uh, Bacane disease and we had a real mapping population from cross of 1121 into 1342, mapped uh, three QTLs in this population, and now through marker-assisted breeding, we are transferring these QTLs into 1121 and several other uh, varieties like 1501, 1401, which are all susceptible to Bacani disease. So uh, this is where, you know, after incorporating the QTLs for Bacani resistance, the new lines in BC1F1, you can see there is a recovery in these plants of the grain length that we have in Pusavasmati 6, similar type, and they have relatively uh, resistant phenotype to Bacani disease, which is a requirement for uh, future. In addition to this, we have been working on, uh, you know, development of herbicide tolerant rice. And uh, we had a tilling project where we induced a mutation for herbicide tolerance in the GINA 22 background. The mutation was characterized and then uh, mapped and markers were developed. And subsequently, we crossed these mutations, uh, mutant of uh, Nagina 22 carrying herbicide tolerance gene uh, with 1121 and 1509, two varieties of basmati rice. And we have transferred the <coughs> gene into basmati background and now we have improved version of 1121 and 1509 and I'm sure you will find time to go to the field to see the phenotype of these uh, plants, how it looks like. Natasha is sitting there in the back who is involved uh, intensively in this uh, program. So this is important, you know, in future. The future of rice cultivation in northwestern India uh, is in direct seeded rice because transplanting takes a lot of water. At the same time, it is uh, highly labor intensive. So to, to solve these two problems, the answer is direct seeded rice. But in direct seeded rice, the major problem that comes is that of weeds. Now we need to have a very effective weedicide who can, which can kill all the weeds population, but nothing happens to the crop. And that is where one herbicide of imidazolinone group, which is called imidazolinone is a very effective herbicide, but rice plants were earlier sensitive to imidazolinone. So we induced mutation through EMS treatment, and these plants were screened with herbicide, you know, Almost acre was grown with M2 population of treated with EMS and all plants died except two plants survived and these two plants carried mutation in ALS gene, acetolactate synthase gene. This gene has got two active sites. One is for binding with herbicide molecule, another is for synthesis of branch chain amino acid leucine, isoleucine and valine. So in normal rice variety, the herbicide binding site is active. If you spray herbicide, herbicide binds with the enzyme and there is a allosteric inhibition that you all know, which does not allow synthesis of leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And because of this, these plants, uh, for want of these amino acids, they die. Okay? Now, what we did in mutation, we altered the herbicide binding site. And therefore, even if you spray herbicide on these plants, the herbicide does not bind to LS. And therefore, these plants, they synthesize leucine, isoleucine, <coughs> valine, and they look normal. So that's what we did. And now you can see that these have been transferred, and after transfer, I will go to the last slide here. You can see how effectively here the original 1121 and 1509 are completely killed, but the lines carrying the mutant allele of ALS, they are completely normal. And along with that, there is killing of all the 
weeds. So now this provides a very potential technology for direct seeded rice where weeds can be very effectively managed. So this will be a major uh, breakthrough as a matter of fact in uh, promoting direct seeded rice. So this is the, the quality features of the newly developed lines. They are as good as 1121 or 1509 for that matter. Also, we have worked on uh, traditional soft grain aromatic rice varieties like Kala Namak is one such variety which is protected under geographical indication. It comes from Eastern UP, uh, part of Eastern UP, 11 districts. And uh, this is uh, traditionally a tall variety, but we have created a dwarf version. Here you can see it is up to my shoulder height, but the reduced height dwarf plants are up to, you know, uh, just less than a meter in height. So they will not last, they have high productivity and will bring a revolution of the kind that we have achieved in Basmati also in short grain aromatic rices. The major uh, concern in implementing marker assisted back cross breeding program or marker assisted forward breeding program is uh, with respect to what population size, what is the throughput of genotyping, what is the cost of genotyping and uh, also like many times we find that marker assisted back cross breeding can only rectify the defect of existing variety. It cannot create a new mega variety, okay? So if we have to create a new mega variety, then we have to follow a different approach and that's where genomic selection becomes extremely important, okay? And in implementing this, we have to go for, you know, a speed breeding, precision phenotyping, regional genotyping center as was well referred by Professor R.B. Singh and efficient breeding management system. These are the innovations that we are using in future plant breeding program so that, uh, you know, the, the genetic gain in these crops can be uh, enhanced. Another project that we have worked for very long, starting in 2002, uh, is golden rice. So you must have heard about golden rice. Uh, rice in general does not have pro-vitamin A, uh, that is beta-carotene, and beta-carotene is a precursor of uh, vitamin A in human system. So when we consume beta-carotene, it is converted into vitamin A in human body. But rice plant does not have any beta-carotene, okay? Pro-vitamin A is not there. And therefore, the genes for pro-vitamin A were earlier transferred from daffodil and later from maize plant, and the transgenic golden rice lines were created uh, in the background of a rice variety called K-bonnet. So through a project from DVT, we got these lines, and our goal was to transfer the gene into high-yielding varieties. And one variety that we took for such program was Sorna, which is a mega variety, and now this picture is not so clear here, uh, but this is uh, golder than gold. If you see the original picture, you can see the, the golden ring here and the color here. Uh, this was the program we started in 2002. We developed the product, but then uh, we had some issues. When we sell these plants to make the gene in homozygous condition, we found that the homozygous plant, they turn dwarf, they become tiny while the null plants, hemigigous plant and original swarla, they are having normal height. In addition to this, there was a drastic reduction in these plants in terms of their penkill exertion and penkill size. So this was a phenotyping which was very phenotype, which was very, very disappointing for us because these plants did not have any agronomic value. And it was that time when uh, uh, Harita joined as a PhD student with me and she took up this challenge to decipher what is the reason as to why these plants are turning dwarf when the plants become homozygous. When they are hemigigous, nothing happens. They are perfectly fine. And after a detailed analysis, she was able to demonstrate that when the trans gene for golden rice was uh, transferred into K bonnet, it got inserted into exon 1 of OX1 gene. OX1 is responsible for OX gene synthesis. And if gene is disrupted, then there won't be oxygen production. And as a result, as long as these plants are hemigigous, hemigigous means one copy is disrupted and other ox1 copy is normal. So you have normal oxygen production, good enough to take care of the plant's need. But the moment you make homozygous for the transgene, both copies are altered, they are disrupted and there is no oxygen production. And because of that, these plants, they become dwarf, they have reduced penkill size, reduced grain number and so on, and uh, poor agronomic value. So now this was a very important investigation because in case of transgenics, and some uh, of the trainees said that they are interested in transgenic, probably 
to know how they are characterized, the molecular characterization of transgenic plant is extremely important. Before we start backcross breeding program using a event as a donor, we must do thorough molecular characterization of the event. So, the molecular characterization is with respect to what is the site of insertion, whether it is inserted into a native gene of the plant disrupting its function and what are the adverse effects. So, this analysis was not done when the events were provided to us and only after we came out with these findings that use of this particular event in golden rice development was stopped globally. So, this was uh, so critical actually and uh, this ultimately you know this kind of uh, lead has delayed the program from 2002 until now very recently only Bangladesh has come forward with some golden rice line using the new event, E event not this particular event that we had used which was being earlier used in all the countries. So, I think these are few uh, success stories, the lessons learned from molecular breeding, what we need to do in future that I have presented before you and if there are certain questions I will be very happy to answer. I would like to thank the entire team of mine, uh, Gopal Krishnan, Pralaya, Harita, Ranjit, Nagarajan, Dr. Vinod all the you know technical supporting staffs, all the students and SRFs working in different projects, my collaborators from National Research Center on Biotechnology and various other uh, places uh, to complement the whole program to come out with the definite results. So with that I would like to thank you very much for your <coughs> presence here. Uh, but I would like to hear from you if you have certain questions because these presentations should be more of uh, uh, dialogue rather than monologue, okay. That is where you learn. I am sure you must have got some questions which uh, uh, you are curious about and please uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have, okay. Go ahead. So, molecular characterization of transgenic event means first thing what is the insertion site, which chromosome the transgene is located, what is the flanking genomic sequences that you have to identify and this can be done by inverse PCR. If you have genomic sequence of that particular crop available, then you do inverse PCR and in inverse PCR you will amplify the flanking genomic regions and then you blast that flanking genomic <coughs> sequence information on the database and that will directly give you a hit which chromosome the gene is located. So, then you can develop markers in the flanking genomic regions and those markers would be important for marker assisted backcross breeding these markers should be co-dominant in nature which can differentiate the plants that are homozygous for the transgene, plants that are hemizygous for the transgene and the plants that are null for the transgenes. So, that is one part of molecular characterization. Second part is that whether the transgene is inserted into a native gene is another important. If it is inserted in a native gene disrupting the vital function, then such events are not called cleaned event. They are not called clean events. They are dirty events, okay. Two, you should also uh, know that after you have developed a transgenic plants, you have to clone the full length gene from the transgenic plants, amplify the full length gene from the transgenic plants, do resequencing and compare the sequence with the original construct. If there is an alteration, that means that something wrong has gone during the process of insertion. So, that also will not be a clean event. That is also part of molecular characterization of transgene. And these are all requirements before you go for clearance of your events to RCGM or GAC for taking up into breeding program. My question is what could be the uh, size in number so that I could get uh, recovery more than 90 percent in EBC1 F1? <coughs> so, it is a very uh, you know uh, difficult question to answer that way, but it would depend upon how many markers in the background are segregating. What is the genetic distance between your recipient parent and donor parent? If your recipient and donor parents are too diverse, that means background genome is highly polymorphic. That means more number of loci are segregating and in that context therefore, the population size has to be increased. 
So my intention is that generally we are dealing with about 100, 200, 300, but at least we should have about 2,000 plants, you know, to be reasonably good in terms of recovering the plants with higher uh, recurrent parent genome. If the donor and recurrent parents are not very diverse, they are close, for example, now we are using uh, improved Pusava Asmati 1 as a donor for bacterial blight, crossing with 1121, not a big deal because all other background genomes are quite similar, quality, elongation, aroma, those things are quite similar. So you will have less polymorphism. So in that case, you can have limited uh, population size can be smaller. So it is related to polymorphism between donor and recurrent parents. <coughs> and other aspect would be the linkage drag and how tight is the linkage drag because you will have to break that uh, through recombinant selection. So if it is uh, too close, then you have to grow a large population to identify recombination between neighboring marker and the uh, gene. Yes? Sir, my question is, uh, till which generation screening continued for ALS uh, inhibiting herbicide? That means for up till which generation we should screen? Means whether it is M3 or we should screen more generation for developing herbicides. So, uh, you know, uh, any mutation would express, if it is, you know, in recessive condition, uh, you will get expression in M2 generation. M2 is like F2, okay? So if you have a large M2 population, you will identify the putative plants which are tolerant because you will spray herbicide and the plants which are tolerant, they will survive, okay? Now, you will have to further ascertain so you will have to go for self progenies of that plant, F2 M2 derived M3 families and then spray the families to identify the plants that are homozygous. The homozygous M2 plants will not segregate and hemizygous plant will show some mortality in the family, okay. So that way in M3 you should be very clear that you have identified a plant which is homozygous for the ALS alteration. Uh, sir, uh, suppose in uh, M2 generation, if we selected some single plants for tolerance, putative tolerance, that we need to screen in M3 generation <coughs> itself. But whether from M2 generation we screen M2 family, whether this family should screen again in M3 generation or only the selected plants in M2 generation from M2 family? So M2 is what? M2 is like F2, yes. okay? You have a M1 plant, you harvested the seeds, those are M2 seeds and when you grow that is M2 population. With respect to a single locus, a plant can be either homozygous for mutation, it can be heterozygous for mutation, or it could be normal wild type. These are the three possibilities. With respect to ALS, for example, if the plant is wild type, okay, the wild plant, wild type plant will be killed. If it is heterozygous or homozygous for mutation, the both plants will survive because there is one normal copy of LS which is able to produce sufficient leucine, isoleucine, valine and therefore the plants which are heterozygous also will be surviving. Now you have to differentiate between the plant that is homozygous and the plant that is heterozygous and therefore you have to harvest the plant seed from the surviving plant, single plant and grow a family. You spray that family, the family which is uh, originating from a heterozygous plant that family will segregate in 3 is to 1 ratio. The one that is originating from homozygous plant will be showing complete resistance. So in M3, it should be very clear. Thank you, sir. So it depends upon the nature of gene that you are dealing with, okay? Yeah. Golden rice, uh, there has been some initial field testing in uh, Bangladesh with one event called E-event. Preliminary releases have been done but not commercially cultivated so far. Only most advanced case is Bangladesh where they have transferred the gene in the background of a variety called BR29. It's a leading variety of Bangladesh. But commercial cultivation is yet to happen. The level of expression in those plants is very low. That's a major bottleneck. It's not very... No, no private company is working on that. Yeah. Syngenta had declared long back that this is for Syngenta, this is a humanitarian project. They want to help people suffering from uh, malnutrition and therefore there is no uh, charge associated with it in the developing countries. And developed countries as such there is no market, you know, if somebody 
uh, there are several other options available for vitamin A. Those who can afford, they can buy and consume. So there was no much commercial market that way. Any other question? So you remember that there is going to be examination at the end also, okay? And uh, today's examination is only to know where you stand, okay? And uh, the last examination will be how you stand. So that will decide your certificate also. And therefore, whatever is being told here, you listen carefully. If you have any doubt, feel free to ask, interact, discuss among yourself also when you go back home. And when you come back, you come back with the questions. Get your all doubt clear, so you will not get that opportunity. Okay. Right, so if there are no questions, I would like to thank you very much for your patience hearing. And uh, maybe if uh, you know there is uh, time permits, I will come back again with some other topics which I which are dear to my mm, heart, which I would like to discuss with you. Okay, may not be in formal presentations like PowerPoint, but on the blackboard. Okay, thank you very much.